this is where we ask the big question, what does it take or what will it take to truly solve the problem? This is Advertising in Africa with Dele Udugbemi on Africa Business Radio. Hi, welcome to another episode of Advertising in Africa with Dele Udugbemi. I've been fortunate to have exposure to advertising in different parts of the continent in the course of my career. And that journey has let me meet some very exciting people. And I was hoping that this podcast would in some way track that journey, which I've shared with most of them, but also importantly to point to the direction advertising is going through on the continent. So one of those who I have run into in the course of my journey has been um, a gentleman called Tosmi Lanipakun who will join me on this episode. His background is in architecture, and that's, I think, the first fascination I had about him when we met, because it just seemed like, oh, are we building stuff in advertising as well? Those are all stuff that, you know, we've spoken about, uh, you know, in the period we've known each other, uh, where at the time I didn't see what the relevance of that training was, and as I started working with Tosi, all of that became clear that, there is a whole lot of thinking and a lot of construction, if you like, that a brand goes through and that is training in some way just brings that to the fore whenever an assignment comes on. And with time, I got to see that, which kind of then wanted to let me sit with him to discuss design thinking. At some point, you know, even I, in terms of a family requirement I'd spoken about it and I was just so blown away about by the extent to which I was able to gather resources for the subject which I then shared with my daughter who herself was very impressed with it so I thought that is something we need to share with the rest of the world first what it is but more importantly also how it applies to Africa and having said that I would now like to welcome Tosin welcome Tosin hello Dele uh, that was a uh lovely lovely intro to this podcast it's a pleasure to be here with you great uh thanks for making time always always good to catch up so i've done a bit of that background the much i can the much that was in my head but again if you don't mind just also just for the listening public just to share a bit of that background and where you are in your career at the moment fantastic uh thanks delay i think for me, I've always been interested in design. Uh, it would either have been design proper or computer engineering. And this is because my mother was a computer engineer. She was one of the pioneer engineers in the company called Net at the time, which then morphed into NITO. Oh. And um, she instilled that sort of sense of curiosity to try and understand what engineering and specifically computer engineering was about mm. but i think i segued at some point in my sort of discovery of that world into a love for design and the built environment somewhere in my mid-team i mm. think it was mm. and so i consequently landed in architecture so i studied at that uh, very famous institution called obafemi awolo university <laughs> yeah. and um, yes mm. yay very mm. fair mm-hmm. and um i think architecture as you were alluding to earlier, gave me a very solid grounding in not just designing buildings or the built environment, but to be an architect, you needed to have apply yourself to a disciplined approach to solving problems. You needed to have a base understanding of technical, visual, as well as service design skills and how to apply those in different contexts. Architecture also surprisingly actually teaches you how to sell or market yourself because you have to actually defend your work in various contexts. And so presentation skills, presenting your work, selling and marketing, those were all foundational elements that I took away from architecture. And I think also being able to think in a very disciplined way. Mm. But I realized at some point in my journey that... um, I was also interested in the broader world of design. Mm. And uh, I started to explore what in that time was still a nascent field called 
digital media. And so I went and did some further study in the field and then started work. My first job was actually going back to architecture. Uh, I worked in a firm called ATO Architects that still remain a fantastic uh, architecture firm uh, in Lagos, milling out brilliant designs and, and building great um, structures in across all across Nigeria. And then uh, my next role was a departure. This is my new sort of interest and burgeoning interest in the broader world of digital media and design led me to a company called GPJ Co. or uh, George P. Johnson Company, who are like uh, sort of one of the pioneers in the industry of experiential design. And there I started to pick up fundamentals of experience design, uh, creating live experiences for large conferences and events, and then moved on into the world of uh, creative agencies. And I, I started with uh, a firm called Art Science and started to learn the ropes on advertising there. And then I kind of crossed over into corporate communications on the client side. And I spent a huge chunk of my career here working with large corporates, uh, especially within the financial sector. I worked with firms like JP Morgan, UBS, uh, the Swiss Bank, worked at Citigroup, all within corporate communications, mm -hmm. design, and marketing. It was interesting to me that banks um, and large financial houses, especially here in the UK where I'm based, are actually quite serious about expressing their brand in a very clear, very distinct way. And also having a very nuanced approach because the way you express yourself to private wealth clients has to be elementally different from the, the kind of treatment and execution required for retail banking, very different from the kind of execution required for retirees and pensioners. Mm. And so all of that what forms sort of the, the basis of some of the work I did during that phase of my career. And then I progressed on about a decade ago to essentially take the big leap to start a, a firm mm. called Image and Time with a colleague and a good friend. Uh, we started out an, a design and advertising agency uh, with roots in Nigeria, interestingly enough. And our practice covers an array of services from creative strategy, branding, graphic design, advertising, digital product design. And of course, to the subject that we will be discussing today, design thinking was part of all of that in terms of how we work. That's such an interesting background. I'm so glad you shared that because there is uh, an assumption that there is this way that you get into advertising and you know you get pigeonholed into a role called creative or called strategy or called, you know. And as you've seen, you know, with the journey you shared, that it's actually more of developing skill set at different points in the journey, and then you can apply that to one particular advertising discipline and. And so on. So we, let's now take design thinking and unpack it and take that into the African experience. Glad you had shared that your journey into that kind of also started from Nigeria. And in my opinion, a lot of how we present our brand, that fundamental structure of how should it have been designed in the first place is always missing where there is this, you know, we're pictorial. So once it's pretty, is enough to take into the market. But there is mm. a lot more thinking, you know, that goes into all of that, which I'd learned in some of the sessions I had with you. So if you could first maybe just give a view about where we are in terms of understanding the need for it in Nigeria, or maybe we could take that into Africa. And secondly, like what that structure actually really is. Before a brand gets taken into the market, the thinking behind how it should be positioned and, you know, that then cascade into brand strategy going forward? Brilliant. I think that's actually an excellent question. One of the things I've noticed is that we seem to struggle with some of the technical elements of structuring our thinking when we're trying to come up with solutions, especially in our industry, the marketing, the advertising industry. And one of the big tools at our disposal and arsenal is this thing called design thinking, which I think, I have to be honest, has not been embraced quite enough mm. uh, in Nigeria or on the African continent. And we'll come to some ideas on what we should be doing with that and, and, and how we can apply it. But 
Let me step back a bit and maybe give some context and some definitions to what design thinking actually is. So it's not to be confused with design. Design thinking is actually a powerful set of tools that take some of the best core principles from design, some of the processes, some of the frameworks from that industry, and frames them in such a way that can be applied to broader business contexts uh, for all types of organizations, large or small, to help deliver better, more effective, more commercially viable business outcomes. It is really a critical tool for sparking innovation, really. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what we do as keepers of brands and shapers of images, innovation is at the heart of what we do. So design thinking should be more embraced within our industry. And just unpacking that a little bit more, Mm -hmm. how does it actually work? So design thinking always starts with people. You know, human centricity, that element of placing the consumer or the customer or the end user at the heart of the conversation Mm. is where design thinking begins. But then it goes into some very clear processes that if we apply them, helps us birth, you know, a very strong kernel of ideas that we can then run with, whether it's that we're applying it in the marketing context or in the campaign context where we're developing the big idea or as, uh, you know, some will call it the long idea, mm-hmm. or whether we're even applying it on the client side where we're developing, you know, uh, product solutions, painting outside the m- margins of advertising, but we're now going into route to market, we're going into product innovation, we're going into connecting with the consumer, whether it's on trade or off trade or whichever context we're applying it. Uh, design thinking provides us a very s- solid grounding to understand how to approach that. And there are three main blocks that we need to understand. The first one is desirability. Mm. Does the customer or the addressable market actually need what we're trying to create? And really, what is at the heart of the problem we're trying to solve? And there are two processes you can apply under desirability. The first one is what I've spoken about around um, placing the consumer at the center, which is empathy. Mm. You know, empathy is all about understanding, walking a mile in their shoes, conducting our research, understanding where they're coming from. And then you move on to problem definition, reframing the context of the problem, understanding the true grief that you need to be solving. And then the second plank after desirability is feasibility. This is where we ask the big question, what does it take or what will it take to truly solve the problem? So we're not painting this cosmetic aesthetic kind of picture that we like to paint in advertising or in the marketing industry mm-hmm. where it leads us to be seen as folks who come into the court of the king as court jesters mm-hmm. versus um, <laughs> our, our new competition in, in the mold of the consultants who are riding on the uh, on the horse. <laughs> you know this, <laughs> you know this is my analogy. Yeah, yeah I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, you know, but I think... When you look at feasibility, we're now asking real questions about what we're trying to do and how we get it done. Mm. And there are processes there around ideation and then prototyping. And the third block is viability. This is where we talk about the money, what it would cost, call it the P&L, call it cost structure versus revenue. But we want to clearly understand the commercials. The, these final two processes under viability are that help get to that point. Is really testing out our assumptions and then finally mapping out our path to executional implementation. In a nutshell, at a very high level, that is design thinking. So if one is now to take that into Africa, so, you know, there is a way when you look at fashion and when you look at our fabric, mm. the Adire, the Ankara, the, you know, all the many things, you know, from the southern part of Africa or from the eastern part, that make them distinct and there's always this question I ask as I travel the continent as we try to apply design thinking into what is African you therefore want your brands to be authentic if you see the Adire you kind of expect this like a West African design kind of stuff or you see the fabrics from East Africa it kind of defines them what's the role of culture in design in that you know for us to almost be very deliberate about positioning our brands that when they're seen elsewhere, they're seen as authentic African brands. How how do we incorporate that? I think that's an amazing question. Mm -hmm. 
for us and for me personally and for our business, we aim to always situate conversations in culture. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is simple. We're nothing if we're not students and advocates of our own culture, mm-hmm. especially seeing where we are in the world today, where interestingly enough, we talk about all of the fringe kind of conversations around appropriation. We talk about what's happening in the positive sense with some of our exports, when we look at the uh, entertainment industry, when we look at the arts, we're seeing that that's sort of a beacon, that's sort of a, an arrowhead for us as Africans, for the rest of the world. Uh, our music opens up doors, our fashion opens up doors, a lot of elements of our culture coming through. And it's been like that for a long time. Yeah. There's a big conversation, for instance, in the UK about repatriating some of our lost, in quotes, lost art, you know, elements from our culture that were taken, you know, nearly a hundred years ago or even more. Exactly. (laughs) Trying to return some of those things. But to your point about the idea, and to our motifs and patterns and, you know, our fashion, these are visual representations of style, visual representations of who we are, our identity. And we're very flamboyant we're very proud of who we are but we're missing a particular sort of bridge Mm. which is how are we packaging up our cultural artifacts how are we selling that to the world what stories and what narratives Mm. are we putting around these elements that actually stand us out in the marketplace because as i think uh i think it was chino achebe that said it that um when the lion does not tell his own story it is up to the hunter to lay out the narrative. In other words, no one can tell the story for us like we can. We're and I think it alive. starts with storytelling. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're the lions and we need to own it. I've seen some very interesting things when I look across Africa. However, I've seen in places like South Africa where you have a gentleman called Laguma who's doing some brilliant work taking some of the motifs from the Indebele tribe mm-hmm. and translating that into creative elements that he's used in fashion. Um, I think he's got a brand called Makosa. Okay. And this brand has gone worldwide and there's partnerships with the likes of Burberry and, um, and Zara and global fashion houses that help to give agency and velocity to promoting those cultural motifs. The question for me is why are we not seeing more of this happening with Nigerian brands, Ghanaian brands, Ghanaian cultural motifs, Nigerian cultural motifs, and the same happening across Eastern Africa as well. I think part of what is missing, apart from storytelling, is also understanding how we find our routes to market. And these are the kind of things that design thinking can help us solve. I'm hoping that there's something Afrobeat or the discovery of Afrobeat, not discovery really, like the guy that said he discovered uh, River Niger Mongo Park, which is another story for another time. But the let's say the fact that Afrobeat has gone mainstream, I think there's something in that journey that we all can learn from, i.e. it is a form of music that had always existed in some form, but it hadn't been deliberately package or sound engineered as if it was designed for others and that's been my learning about how we've taken you know whatever belongs to us we rather than think it can whether it's in our narrative or whatever whether you know we don't tend to look at it as if it was meant to be shared with others we oftentimes feel um like we need to look inward so if you have the address back to that address story the Adere is meant to be told as a story to an African because it's an African print, mm-hmm. right? Whereas if you flip it, then you realize that it's a fabric. Just about anyone in the world can wear it. Then it starts becoming Absolutely. your ambition to take it up. But you therefore realize that the journey into making that global is, as you've pointed out, that narrative that first situates it in terms of its authenticity so that when the person picks it up, recognize it for what it is and want to associate with that so that that's the missing link i think i think there's been a lot of could be our colonial past or whatever the story is where there's just a lot more of adopting what comes rather than a designing of what we have 
for us to take outwards. You know, then in the Nigerian story in particular, we're spoiled by the oil and the ease of, you know, foreign exchange coming from selling natural resources and not think in the wider form of, you know, what it is that we have that can get, you know, elsewhere. Uh, case in point, um, how well loved the Nigerian jersey was at the 2018 uh, World Cup, which you and I saw the Argentina yes. game together in Johannesburg. Yes, we did. We watched that don't, together. Don't tell, don't, don't tell anybody's that. results. Shh, 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 shh. <laughs> don't tell them. Don't, don't, don't break their heart. Uh, we wouldn't say that. We yeah, we wouldn't say that. But it's how authentic that was and how much the world loved it that even us Nigerians, we couldn't even get it to buy. You know? And That's for me, crazy. I think those are just very good examples, you know, of things that are authentic and so different and can be taken and, and I think to try to bring the message home to I think the the reason I felt it was good to talk about design wasn't just the technical I know you're technically gifted in it but the mindset the need for I think which you've identified but also that it doesn't have to come from a person who's been into a school label design do you get what I'm saying? Absolutely. That this, this is really about a mindset shift. Something that lets you take what's yes. yours, apply a different kind of outlook to it, a different mind, a different audience, if you like, uh, um, in terms of who it's meant for, with a narrative around that, and then, and then push it out. And then at some point we'll be talking about African days, authentic days, and, you know, I think there's just a whole dimension we haven't touched, really. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I completely agree with you. I think that um, when you spoke about Afrobeats, mm. it reminded me of an element of design thinking that, you know, we we really need to bring into our our processes when mm. we when we look at areas like music and entertainment. So one of the of course the great success stories we have is that you're starting to see I mean, global adoption of Afrobeats, um, essentially, our music is traveling very well. I remember a trip I went on recently to, uh, well, before the pandemic, to, to New York. Mm. And in one day, I think I heard one of Davido's songs played about five times in different taxi cabs, you know. <laughs> and it just kind of brought home to me that what has happened here is that our music is being packaged in a way that travels well. Correct. To your point about um, how do you package your product and how do you package culture? Music is a universal language. Yeah. You know, it does not discriminate. But there are elements in that music. There are uh, sort of sound cues. There are elements of quality. And there are distribution channels that we need to look at um, that helps us get our music from being local mm -hmm. to becoming globally accepted and, and onto that uh, sort of global stage. Mm -hmm. the, the, the other thing around um, music and how culture is tra transported is to start to look at um, the assets we have as Africans, especially when we look at local versus the diaspora and the opportunities to actually really uh, connect the two you know, the African and the Africans in diaspora. I think there's a great opportunity there to leverage what we have to move us forward. Absolutely, Adrian. So to uh, now finally bring the message to where we are, which is a post-pandemic world. So pretty much we locked down over the last 18 months or so, and we're tentatively beginning to, you know, find our way back in recognizing that there is a, a room for a wider audience than we were previously looking at in terms of what we do, whether that's in advertising or in other areas of, of the African uh, business world. What, in your view, can we do differently? Uh, um, um, you know, there's so many things that come out of this uh, post-pandemic era. Remote working, you know, uh, the, uh, the role of digital you know, all of that, all of that, in trying to say that, like, maybe this is an opportunity for a reset, and with design thinking at the heart of what your response should be, wh what should we be seeking to do? Because we've kind of talked about what we hadn't done, and, you know, the consequence of that, so therefore, yeah. we haven't been as global as we should be, 
uh, to then now try to address that, what are the things in your view that we can do that can just lift the game? As wide as we can with the response, but we just our design or solution finding can be at the heart of, you know, uh, whatever we do post-pandemic. I think that um, this is absolutely a vital question for where we are in the world today. For me, it's very simple. We learned what I I was discussing with someone recently. I said that um, the pandemic helped us learn some new skills, you know, and sharpen some old ones as well. Um, you speak about remote working. You speak about digital first. It is very clear now that we all have to embrace fully this digital world that we now live in. And that means that whatever products, solutions, um, initiatives we have has to live in the cloud. We have to provide um, digital access to, I mean, if it's elements of our culture, if it's elements of, you know, the way we, you know, our local innovations, those things have to find their way across borders now. And we have, you know, uh, we have a moment here where a global reset button has been pressed. You know, all of us are re-embracing, you know, this digital experience, this digital world that we're in where, I mean, you and I are on a, a digital platform talking 4,000 miles apart from each other as if we're sat in the same room. Yeah. So what does that, what opportunity does that provide for key sectors in our economy uh, to promote, to sell, to add value? The customer is not local anymore. The customer sits everywhere. Mm. Um, and your product, if you're able to package it effectively, can travel well. There are global logistics systems, global distribution systems that we can leverage. But embracing digital is absolutely key for where we are today. Right. Uh, um, spoken like a pro. Thank you so much, Tosin. Uh, we could go on for a whole year if we chose, but for the purpose of the podcast, it was just all about just trying to bring the issues out, bring it to reality, make it practical for those who might want to apply that in their journey. So on that note, I would like to thank Tosilani Pepper for making time to have the session. It is very extensive and I'm sure there will be other times when we'll, we'll sit down again to, to talk about. I just thought that we could, in, in all the sessions that we have, that we would maybe have it offline, we have it in between meetings or while traveling, you know, all of that. I just thought maybe us putting it together as a library of thought for other people to maybe learn from it just a, a good use of our time so you've made the time quite worth the while i really like to thank you for all the you know time you've put in thank you so much it's my pleasure and um yeah thank you uh, it's a pleasure to be here all right then so thank you Tosi. and then just to wrap up my name is Dele Odubemi. i'm currently the country manager of just the call uh, in nigeria that's the world's foremost outdoor advertising company. So I'd like to thank you for making time to, to listen to us and look forward to you joining us on the next episode. If you want to learn from us or if you want to reach out to us, please use our LinkedIn detail. So you want to give your LinkedIn? Well, my LinkedIn yeah. is Olutosin Lani Kwekun. Okay. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Okay, thank great. you. Thank you, Tosin. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.